is my nature. I do not struggle to do the world. I do the world naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name, and every believer says a powerful amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of the social media community, our brothers online. We're so glad to welcome all of you again to another, another year of, of feasting and growing in the knowledge of Christ. We also want to welcome the Akwai State community connected to the service by way of Comfort FM, XL FM, Radio Akwai Bomb, Passion FM, Inspiration FM, Heritage FM. We're so glad to welcome all of you. Wherever you're hearing the sound of my voice, I want to ask you to help me and, you know, call a friend, a loved one, ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. Our campus is around the world. We are so glad to welcome all of you to the service this morning, guys. We're going to have a great and exciting time as we adventure in the word of his grace. All of those on social media and every one of you that is a part of this ministry, like you've always done, I want to ask you to help us share the video, put them on LinkedIn, WhatsApp groups, Telegram. Let's flood the earth with the truth of the gospel of Christ Jesus. Anybody excited in the service this morning about the word? Can we give the Lord a celebration this morning? Glory! Amen! Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, and your phones. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word of his grace this morning. All right, help me share the video. You know, invite as many people as possible. We're beginning a series as the new year begins, and it's our usual new creation camp meeting, where we take time to look at Brother Paul's revelation of identification. So we're going to be examining the in Christ realities, and this is season number three. We have done season one, we have done season two, this is season three, and usually that is a series we begin with at the end of every year, if you've been following the, the, the pattern of things in this ministry. All right, so um, we're looking at the in Christ realities, and it is Brother Paul's revelation of identification. We want to look at the uniqueness of the Pauline revelation, the uniqueness of the Pauline revelation. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse number 15, Brother Paul writes a letter to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Very vital because Paul is writing to a pastor, one of his spiritual sons, or most likely his most trusted ally in ministry. Paul always lends credence to the fact that the authority of his letters were from the scriptures. When we say the scriptures, of course, by now you know that we refer to the Old Testament books of Genesis to Malachi. But you see that in John chapter 16 verse 12, Jesus is speaking in John 16 verse 12 and he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Look at the next verse. And he says in verse 13, How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth. The spirit of truth, when he is come, he will guide you into all the truth. Meaning, I have not told you all the truth. But when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all of the truth. That's the way it is in the original Greek. All of the truth. Jesus said that towards the last minute of his death on earth, physically speaking. And brother Paul now talks about doctrine in the next verse of that second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. He says, doctrine is a function of persuasion. Doctrine is a function of persuasion correction and instruction in righteousness from the holy scriptures referring to the old testament books please i need you to pay very close attention very very close attention in a few minutes you know why i'm advising you like this interestingly brother paul doesn't make reference to anything jesus wrote because jesus never wrote anything i mean he never wrote any book he never wrote 
So brother Paul never made reference to what Jesus wrote. Peter as well now tells us something very, very unique to pay attention to. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15 and 16. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. According to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Next verse. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Mm. Pick that word wisdom. The wisdom given to him is the word Sophia. It brings in insight. That is, there's an insight that brother Paul has. Insight will be an education. No doubt, and brother Peter lends credence here to brother Paul's education, which interestingly uses the word Sophia. And that word Sophia is the same word he had used earlier on in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Cunningly devised fables. The word Sophia. So he used that word. Sophia, which is where, where we have the word sophizo, cunningly devised fables, sophizo, which is the expert use of knowledge. The expert use of knowledge. And in the sense of imagination, creation, and suggestion, the expert use of knowledge. But he now comes here and says, Paul's grabs of the scriptures is a sophizo. Paul's grasp of the scriptures is a sophizo, which is Sophia. In accurate use of Sophia or an expert use. So again, he mentions the word salvation. And brother Paul says to Timothy that his doctrine is about faith which is in Christ. Or salvation, the scriptures will make you wise. Sophia, skillful unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus which is the word sophizo again and salvation which is the word soteria s-o-t-e-r-i-a which is the study or the concept of saving or being saved or the savior soteria the concept of saving or being saved or the savior. Notice a fact that Paul now introduces. Remember, brother Paul has never had a physical contact with Jesus. He has never had a physical contact with Jesus. Yet he says this confidently in verse 15. Salvation through faith which is in Christ. The word pistis, which is in the Messiah. Pistis, the Greek word, which is in the Messiah, or pistis in the Savior. By using Savior and using soteria in the same line, soteria will be the act of saving or saving act which has two words. One of them is the word sota, S-O-T-E-R, which you are acquainted with in this church by now because I talked a little bit of it in one of the soterias. So Paul is saying the faith in Christ or faith in the sota. Faith in the sota. Obviously in verse 15, the sota will be the Christ. The sota will be the Christ. You can't call him the Christ and in salvation, he is not the Christ. If he is the Christ, it means he is the Christ in salvation. The Sota, therefore, brings in one of those concepts 
that Peter says about Paul's soonesses, about Paul's wisdom or Paul's insight. So Paul identifies Jesus as a sota, and that again is a mode of explanation of the subject of salvation. Now the word sota, therefore, will come in from Paul's education. The word sota will come in from Paul's education and will come in from how it becomes relevant. Brother Paul is a Roman citizen and Brother Paul is a Jew. A Roman citizen and a Jew. And then Sota, therefore, of those days, if you remember back, I said to you, when we teach you biblical concepts, you must sit where they sat and hear what they heard to be able to understand what they were saying. You can't sit somewhere else to understand what they understood where they sat when they heard when they, what they heard. Now that will help you in this explanation that I'm bringing. So in those days, the word sota, and do not forget that language then is the use of words. Language is the use of words. It has many historical meanings and application at the present age. So many times, the farther we depart from the usage of this word in the century where it was applied, we may not exactly get what he was saying. Now, by using the word sota, he brings in a concept of soteria, a concept that a first century Christian will understand because the word sota refers to nobles. The word sota refers to nobles. It refers to kings and emperors. The word sota. So he brings in a concept of salvation that is totally different from the idea of Jesus saving a man so that the man will die and go to heaven. Totally different from that concept. Because the moment Brother Paul introduces Sota into the equation, it's no more about Jesus saving a man, the man dies and go to heaven. He brings in Sota. And Sota, where you have Soteria, what he calls the Messiah. The Messiah will be that idea of a Roman conquest. That is a king who conquers a region or conquers a place. So therefore, by calling Jesus a sota in that sense, he brings in this very vital concept of salvation. And it's important in its own revelation as well. And so you look at that term basically. We split it and we first examine the word soteria. Soteria before we examine sota. Which is a term you find used in the four gospels which is approximately used about six times. Soteria in the four gospels used six times. A few statistics, very useful for you in your apologia. Six times it's used. Luke chapter 1 verse 69. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1 verse number 69. Luke chapter 1 verse number 69. And had raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Luke has this polite flavor in his writing. Dr. Luke, he has this polite flavor by saying his servant David. David was a king, an emperor of an empire. Then in verse 77 of Luke chapter 1, that's the second mention, Luke chapter 1 verse 77, <clears throat> to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. Remember again, a sota, where you have soteria, will always have a noble, an emperor, or a conquest. Conquest must be in mind as we continue this journey. Then in Luke chapter 2, verse number 30. Luke 
chapter 2 verse number 30 <clears throat> for mine eyes have seen thy salvation my eyes that was Simeon basically when he saw Jesus when he saw Jesus he called Jesus salvation for my eyes have seen thy salvation let's look at meaning of that my eyes have seen the conquest of the sota salvation the conquest of the sota that's what it means by my eyes have seen the salvation it means my eyes have seen the conquest of the sota the conquest of the noble or the conquest of the king or the conquest of the emperor or the conquest of the warrior then he says in Luke chapter 3 verse 6. Luke chapter 3 verse number 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. All flesh. This is John the Baptist. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. In Luke chapter 19 verse 9. Jesus uses that phrase. By talking in the house of Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 16, I mean 19 verse 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. This day is salvation come to this house. For so much as he also is a son of Abraham. Salvation has come to thy house. That is a conquest is about to be accomplished the claim of a territory the claim of a territory then look at john chapter 4 verse 22 jesus uses the word when conversing with the woman at the well you worship you know not what we know what we worship for salvation is of the jews salvation is of the Jews is the word exoteria. It means the sota is a Jew. Or salvation comes from the Jews. It's not saying only Jews can be saved. It's talking about the origin from where salvation comes. Now in the book of Acts, you will see that phrase soteria in the book of Acts. We have looked at the four gospels. So now we're moving to the book of Acts. Because you can't study salvation outside the person of the noble. You cannot study salvation outside the person of the noble. There must be a noble involved. There must be a warrior. There must be a personality involved in the act of soteria. In the book of Acts, you will discover Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Please pay attention. Acts chapter 4 verse number 12. Neither is there salvation in any order. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Remember as he says that in verse 11, he has spoken about the stone which the builders rejected. In verse 11 of that Acts chapter 4. After talking about the stone which the builders rejected, he now said salvation cannot be found in any order. That stone that the builders rejected is now the cornerstone or the chief corner. Meaning that salvation cannot be found anywhere else other than in this stone. So you cannot talk about soteria without the noble, the sota, the emperor, the king, or the conqueror. Now, <clears throat> stay with me. So there is a person involved. You cannot have soteria and there is no person involved. There must be a savior, a noble who is the sota. In Acts chapter 13, verse number 26, let's look at brother Paul, Acts 13, 26. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feared God... To you is the word of this salvation sent. This salvation or 
this act of claiming a territory. To you is this word or this act of claiming a territory sent. Don't forget a territory is involved. A territory or a place or a people are involved. Look at Acts chapter 13 verse 47 again. The people become the conquered. For so had the Lord commanded us saying, I have said thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. A territory or a territory to be conquered. Acts 28, 28, the last reference in the book of Acts. Acts 28, 28. Be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. In salvation, a conquest, a claim of a territory is in view. A conquest, a claim of a territory is in view. Now, let's come into the use of that word because we have seen how Jesus barely used it. Jesus used it twice. The first one, Luke 19, 9, in the house of Zacchaeus. The second time, and the last time, in John 40, 4, 22, in the discourse with the woman at the well. But look at Paul. The use of the word salvation, or soteria, is used 46 times in the New Testament Greek. 46 times. But then 20 times used by Paul alone. Out of the 46, Paul alone used the word 20 times. That is, Jesus mentions twice. Simeon mentions one. I'm talking about four gospel. I mean, New Testament Greek. Two by Zacharias' prophecy. One by John the Baptist, making it six. Then Paul, 20. So by the time you come to the epistles, Paul has 20 of the usage of the word salvation alone. In the book of Hebrews, you will see it in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. Who shall be heirs of salvation? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. Then Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. Mm -mm. Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, Hebrews 2, 3, so great salvation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death, taste death for everyone. All right? So, he has become the captain of their salvation in verse 10. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So salvation, he becomes the noble here. The very actor, the captain of salvation, the noble. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 9, where the writer said, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we do speak then Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Peter definitely uses the phrase salvation. And you can take this down and check when you get home. First Peter chapter 1 verse 5. First Peter chapter 1 verse 5 
verse 9 and verse 10. First Peter chapter 1, 5, 9 and 10. And obviously, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. Where it says we accounted the long suffering of God is salvation. Jude uses it once. Jude chapter 1 verse 3. Common salvation that you contend. The common salvation. Revelation uses the word salvation three times. Now remember, the sota is always an actor in the soteria. There must be a territory, a region that is conquered. There must be an empire in view whenever you use the word salvation. Now coming to the actor, that's the sota, it means that in essence, if you study the salvation, like I said, salvation is not a spiritual term. It is used spiritually in the Bible, but it is not a spiritual term. It means to save a territory, to conquer, to preserve a place. It is used for those who preserve, protect, and conquer territories. They preserve, they protect, and conquer territories. Following that, you must therefore study the person in the act. You must study the person in the act. And that's what Paul was saying to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. And that from a child, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You have known the holy scriptures. So therefore, there will be studies on the person. The actor in the scene. Don't forget that as I said earlier. That Paul never had any physical contact with Jesus. Please, that's very key. Paul and Jesus never met physically on earth. Now the word sota is used in the four gospels a couple of times. In the entire New Testament Greek. It's used 21 times. Less than half of the time, you have the word salvation. In Luke chapter 1 verse 47, it is used by a third party. Luke chapter 1 verse 47. And my spirit had rejoiced in God my Savior. My spirit has rejoiced. This is where Mary was speaking to Elizabeth. And she used the word, my savior. Just before Zechariah's prophecy. God, my sota. God, my sota. So she acknowledges. Because she knew from the incarnation. She knew from the incarnation. And she knew from the scriptures. That Jesus is God in the flesh. That Jesus is God in the flesh. So she said, God, my sota. Look at Luke chapter 2 verse 11. Luke chapter 2 verse number 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior. Which is Christ the Lord. Like I mentioned, these are third party statements. Those things mustn't be missing. He is talking about a king. So therefore, it flows in the understanding. A king, David, city. Then he talks about a sota. Again, a third party. Luke chapter 4 verse 42. The woman at the well. Luke chapter, I mean John chapter 4. John chapter 4 verse 42. The woman at the well. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying. For we have heard him ourselves. And know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. 
That means we will not find Jesus use that phrase. So now he uses Messiah. Messiah. There are two terms. Messiah, which is Christos. Then you have Sota. Two terms. Messiah, Christos. Then two, Sota. We are looking at Sota here because that was what Paul said. And that was what Peter mentioned about Paul in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, there are two places the word sota is mentioned. Acts chapter 5 verse 31 by Peter. Acts chapter 5 verse 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. For to give repentance to Israel... And forgiveness of sins. The word prince is the word ruler. One who rules. A prince and a ruler are not two different things. A king definitely or a ruler who is a sota. So he claims a territory. He calls him a ruler. Which is a claimer or a conqueror, one who conquers a territory. Look at brother Paul in Acts 13, 23. Acts chapter 13, verse 23. Of this man's seed had God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a savior, Jesus. In the Pauline epistles, we have that word used 12 times. So this is 13 out of 21. And Peter uses this phrase, Sota. Remember, it has to do with territories that are conquered, claimed, preserved. Peter uses this phrase as well. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. Are you still here? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 11 put it up for me second peter chapter 1 verse 11 for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ our Lord and Sota. So he brings in the concept of kingdom because of the Sota. A claim of territory and a preserver. Look at 2 Peter 2.20 where Peter was talking about uh, the, an expose on the unsaved. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. An expose on the unsaved. Then look at 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 2. A lot of scriptures, but that's how doctrine is built. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And of the commandment of us the apostles. And of the Lord and Savior. Look at verse 18. 2 Peter 3, 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Of our Lord and Savior, conqueror and emperor, a claimer of territory, a preserver of territory, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Savior, Emperor, Conqueror, Claimer of territory, Preserver of territory, Jesus Christ, to him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. First John chapter 4, verse 14. Remember, John was the one who wrote John chapter 4, verse 42, where we saw earlier on. 
So now he, he wrote in 1 John 4.14 and we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. The savior or conqueror or emperor who claims territories and preserves them. Then Jude chapter 1 verse 25. Jude, to the only wise God, our Sota, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. So therefore, in the back of Paul's use of words and his insight, there comes the claim of Jesus Claiming or preserving a territory. And you must bring that in mind as you read Brother Paul's words. That there is a territory involved. There is what you can call a conquest involved. So most of the times, the language of the sota will involve a war. The language. A war and all that is always a question of strength, power, and authority. Now Peter therefore could acknowledge that Paul had a way around his explanation of Jesus. Peter acknowledged that. You know, in his act of salvation, a unique insight. That you and I must flow with. It's important to note that Paul was not there physically. You know, he wasn't there. Paul and G please don't forget, don't lose that point. Paul and Jesus never met physically at any time in the four gospels. So there must be something that Peter could see in Paul's writing. How many of you know Peter and Jesus were together on earth physically? You know that? You know that? Peter even rebuked Jesus at one time and Jesus rebuked him back. You know, Peter even used his knife to cut off somebody's ear for Jesus and Jesus put the ear back and told him to put the knife back. Put it back. <laughs> Don't throw it away. Put it back because you may need it to eat mango. <laughs> so there must be something that Peter could see in Paul's writings that almost makes the bystanders believe that Paul must have seen Jesus because he couldn't have said the Lord Jesus Christ to Paul if they didn't show how Paul taught Jesus without seeing him physically. That's why Peter calls it an insight. A sophizo. An insight. Therefore, you have to understand Paul's imageries. You have to. And you have to see how Jesus' parables were written as well. Because if you don't understand that Paul had a skill to writing, therefore Paul's use of words also will be a pointer to how you ought to read his letters. His use of words. <laughs> his use of words. He was intentional. He was deliberate in his use of words. He was not careless in the choice, in the use of his words. Peter acknowledged the insight in Brother Paul's education and how he wrote.
And you can get lost easily. In how brother Paul brings in a fact. You get that? Hey. Hey. As there are many pastors who not, they will not preach epistles. They won't even there. They don't stay with the Old Testament. David met Goliath. Gola, Gola, Gola say, eh? Devo, Devo. This year, your Goliath must die. Amen. He must die. Amen. The Egyptians you see today, you will see them again no more. Amen. Pharaoh and his army will be drawn in the sea. Amen. That's all you see. They won't come here. Here is where the big boys chill. Chilling with the big boys. Here. <laughs> somebody, you know, somebody said, it's like Dr. Damina knows what is happening around. Jessimiel, my second daughter, said, how can you have people like us and not know what is going around? <laughs> this is where the big boys chill, man. If you don't understand, no worry, it's not for your generation. It's for our generation. <laughs> Woo! Was that some lecture this morning? We never finish it. We just start. I just they bring up. Again, I have just shown you that Paul taught Jesus as a sota. He taught him as an emperor, someone who conquers. If you don't have that at the back of your mind, you may get lost at the way Paul speaks. When Peter says that some people twist things, to their own destruction, they twist it. The unlearned and the stable, the unstable, they rest. They rest. You know. <laughs> Let me introduce a concept and hang it. And I will cruise with it in the second service. Let's see one of these concepts that some people twist to their own destruction. One of them will be 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I grew up to believe that the Bible teaches what we call rapture. Rapture. You know we have this rapture theory from the movies. Rapture theory from drama. You know? I have done outreaches using movies of those rapture. And the people who came to those crusades were raptured. Left behind. Rapture. 666. Six, six. Born in hell. Okay? And people just cry all over the place hopelessly. But then is a lack of understanding of language. Again, you must be careful with the Pauline verbiage. You must be careful. You must be careful with the way the Pauline theology communicates truths. With the concepts documented in the Pauline theology. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. 1 Thessalonians. But I will not have you to be ignorant. I will not have you to be ignorant. Brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That you sorrow not, even as others, which have no hope. <laughs> there are things, some things are mentioned, and some people went to report to Bishop Mike. 
that I said that there is no rapture. You know, people can blackmail you easily. And I told Bishop Mike, it's mischievous people who are poor listeners, dull in their mind, whose IQ is still on the floor, who said that to him. And I don't care who they are. That is the definition of their mentality. Then they also told him that I teach that Jesus is not coming again. I told him they have a twisted mindset. The word twisted means wicked. You know, wicked. Just like you have twisted, wicked furniture. Wicked. You know, the things I teach are too high for poor souls. They are too high. You must come down from where your high horse and be like a little child for you to comprehend. Otherwise, you will remain in the seat of the unlearned. We are not teaching physics here. We are teaching what people like Peter who saw Jesus when they read what we are teaching, Peter submitted they are hard. I'm talking of Peter. He saw Jesus, sat with Jesus, learned from Jesus himself. Hours unending. Paul never saw Jesus. Not once. Yet, when Paul wrote and Peter read, Peter said, brethren, Brethren, they are hard. Those are the things we are dealing with here. Don't bring your CRK sense here. It will not work. Yeah, it, it takes revelation knowledge. It takes what? Did you observe that no apostle, no apostle, not Peter, not Jude, none of those writers of New Testament material. None of them prayed for your eyes to be enlightened, only Paul. Because he knew what he wrote. He knew what he wrote. He knew what he wrote. So after writing, he now started praying that the eyes of your own, because this thing is not going to come like this. Dr. Damina, are you saying, yes, I'm saying, are you saying, yes, I'm saying, what is it? You can't harass me to learn from me. You must calm down and sit down. Then we can painstakingly and patiently and tediously bring you to a place of understanding. See, I hear. He said they rest. Hmm. Look at the word asleep in that first Corinthians, I mean first Thessalonians 4 13. That word asleep. <laughs> but I will not have you. Please pay attention, I beg you. I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. That phrase, asleep, is an idiom. That's why people call it in the natural, rest in peace. When people die, say, R-I-P, rest in peace. They took it from that word, asleep. It's an idiom Jesus used. And when Jesus used it, Paul was not there. 
Yeah, John 11, 11, put it up. It's Jesus. Jesus is the inventor of that idiom. John 11, 11. This thing said he, and after that he saith unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. And here Paul is using that same phrase. He is asleep. That was when Lazarus had died and Jesus knew it by revelation that Lazarus has died. So Jesus calls resurrection. And this is how Jesus talks. That I may wake him. That I may awake him out of sleep. What Jesus is saying is resurrection. But look at the way Jesus uses words. Look at Jesus' church members. How they responded to what Jesus said. To show you that they were his members, but they were not good learners. In verse 12 of John 11. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, it's a good thing. <laughs> There's insomnia everywhere. So at least he's sleepy. It's a good thing. <laughs> Next verse. <laughs> Next verse. How be it? Jesus spake of his death. That means when Jesus even spoke, there was more to what he said that required explanation. The words were not literal. Put it, put it back for me. How be it Jesus speak of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Next verse. Next verse. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Dummy. <laughs> Did you see use of words? So here Paul is using the same phrase. Imagine the word asleep. Again, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. But before he does, he says in John eleven twenty five 25 to 26. John eleven twenty five 25 to 26. John 11. Jesus said unto her. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I am the resurrection. I don't have resurrection. I am the embodiment of resurrection. Once you believe in me, you are raised. I am the resurrection and the life. Even if you are dead, if you believe in me, you live. Give me verse 26. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall eh? 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 So that is why he used the word sleep. Zoe, Zoe. You guys are ready? We're going to sing it in a few minutes now. Because I'm through with this service. <laughs> if you believe, you never die. Never. You never die. <laughs> you never die. If you don't believe, you die. <laughs> You die. But if you believe, 
you believe in the Christos, the Sota. Once you believe, you become his conquered territory. He now preserves. Don't make me rush, man. The Sota owns the territory, keeps the territory, and stops invaders from invading the territory. And no man can defend the conqueror, the emperor, the ruler, the Sota of this territory. So that's why once you believe in him, So losing salvation doesn't come into this matter. This Sota is not Buhari. Whom Boko Haram have taken some of his territory. No, 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 no. It's not Buhari. Whom part of his country is being molested. The Sota, we are, the emperor we are talking about here. He didn't save you by luck. He saved you by conquest. He didn't save you to look after yourself. He saved you to preserve you. Do you know that it is an insult for you to have a king and invaders invade his territory and molest his citizens is an insult. It's actually a spite. It's like throwing saliva on the emperor. Yeah. And he can do nothing about it. And while he is in power, his citizens are being molested. They can't travel freely. They can't sleep well. They cannot enjoy their liberties because foreigners have invaded their territory. It means his military power, his intelligence, his naval officers, his air forces, and his policemen are not effective in their operations. It means he being the commander in chief, he is commandless. A country is called a sovereignty because it has a commander in chief that ensures that the territorial integrity of that country is protected. Whatever it takes. That is why when a president is sworn into power, when he is sworn in, the first thing he swears to is to protect and defend the constitution of the Federal Republic of so, 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 so. That's the first line in the oath of office. That's the first line of his oath. That's the first thing he swears to. Every other thing is secondary. The primary responsibility of an emperor or ruler is to protect the territorial that there should be no compromise to the integrity of his territory. That's why Jesus said, I give unto you eternal life. And you shall never perish. My father that gave you to me is greater than all and no man can take you so my hand and my father's hand. Those pastors who say you can lose salvation, they need to go back to school. Because it's an insult on Jesus. It's an insult on the office and the person of Jesus. That is, they have equated Jesus to Buhari's life. In fact, less than Buhari You know, people must sit where you sit to hear what you hear. 
so they can understand what you're understanding. So if we also sat where they sat, people hearing us after now must sit where we are sitting. You don't understand what I just said. Stand up, that's all I got for in this service. Glory to God. Zezum alata. Enge bojaka yada. Me borokodo sekeya. He is able to save. To where? <laughs> Put it up for me. Hebrews 7 25. Zoe, Zoe. You guys are ready? I want it in the Amplified so we can read like a mass choir, everybody. Amplified Hebrews. Can we all read together? Everybody want to go. Therefore, he is able also. To save to the uttermost. Completely. Perfectly. Finally. And for all time and eternity. Those who come to God through him. Since he is always living to make petition to God. And intercede with him. And intervene for them. Lift your right hand and say I am saved. Eternally. Completely for all time and eternity by Jesus Christ. I didn't hear a good amen. Are you blessed this morning? Can you guys come quickly? Come, let's sing that song. Let's sing that song. Let's do it together, everybody. Hey, Gabo Jacayada. The Lord, hallelujah. Cabo Zekele. This life that I have. That's right. It's the life of God in me. Put on the lyrics for us on the screen. That I have is the life of God. This life that I have. Give us the lyrics on the screen. In me. This life that I have is the life of Christ. This life, this life that I have. Come on. This life, this life that, I that I have is the life, is the life oh, of that? God. This life, this life that I have, that I have is the life, is the life oh. of Christ. Come on, we have it.
for the work of your spirit in our hearts. Revelation knowledge is growing every day in this house. And we rejoice that Lord in this season great things are being accomplished in us and through us. And we rejoice. Thank you for making us collaborators. Thank you for giving us the privilege to walk with you and to walk for you and for you to walk through us in us by us and we thank you Lord I pray that through this month as we spend time in the study of the word in fasting and in prayer that your people will rise into the fullness of your intent for everyone thank you Father we decree that sick bodies are healed right now sick bodies are healed right now Bodies and yokes are destroyed right now. In the name of Jesus. The reality of this life finds expression in us and through us. Thank you for answered prayer. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you Lord. In Jesus name. And every believer sees a powerful amen. Now listen before I take up your offerings and this is both for the benefit of the online community and all our campuses around the world. The fasting begins tomorrow. The fast for the next 40 days is going to be in the evenings. 
You eat your breakfast in the morning and walk your, your way through the day, your usual life. Then you miss your dinner and our fasting begins 6 in the evening to 6 in the morning and we will use most of the night time to pray and to study the word. So what we're going to be doing is each evening we'll be here from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. every evening, two hours in church for word and prayer. Campuses, you decide how you want to meet as it is peculiar to your areas. And the online community, you, you need to be here with us every evening at 6 p.m. We'll be live till about 8 o'clock teaching and praying. The fasting begins. Then at about 9.30, 9.30 in the evening at home, there will be a teaching from 9.30 to 10.30. Everybody is supposed to follow and take your notes because fasting is word and prayer. Then after the teaching, there will be prayer from about 10.30 till about midnight. You can pray through it with us. You can pray over it even after us. Whatever works for you at home. And then you sleep if you want to. Till about 5 a.m. when you have to be up. Then we will pray for an hour. 5 to 6 online. And then at 6 you can break your fast. If that is when you take breakfast. Or whatever. Is it clear? 6 to 8 in church. From 9.30 till about midnight, at home, Bible study and prayer. Then 5 to 6 a.m., one hour prayer. And you are ready for the day. Are you excited about it? Are you excited about it? You know, so everybody organize yourself, buy data, put on your phone. Because the nighttime prayers and Bible studies are very important. They are not things you want to stay out of. They're going to help you a great deal to situate you in the plan and the purpose that God has for your life. Can I have a good amen? The second thing is, I spoke about this last Sunday. The Lord laid in my heart to share with this church that by, between and the end of January, we're raising $100,000 for the first project of the year. And some people have made commitments. Those of you that are here to make commitments to us eat, you have another opportunity to make your commitments today. The online community, if you want to be part of this, maybe you want to give us $10,000, $5,000, $1,000, you know, $500, depending on your ability. You want to make sure that as the year begins in this year of massive kingdom assignment, that your money goes into kingdom project as the first thing you're doing in 2022 to honor God and honor his cause on the earth. So if you want to be part of this giving, you just need to send a mail to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. We will email you the dedicated account where these monies are supposed to go to. And at the end of January, we'll have all of this money and get that project on the way. And we believe that everyone who is steered up by God to give, you know, uh, in your heart, you already know that the Spirit of God is bearing witness. And we want to thank you for making yourself available. Can I have a powerful amen? amen. All right, grab your worship offerings. Let's give this morning. Let's honor Jesus. Your worship offerings, Sunday morning worship offerings. We give in honor of the Christ. You don't want to miss the next service because I'm going to be dealing with the whole rapture concept doctrinally in the next service. You don't want to miss it. And then from tomorrow we begin 6 to 8 and I continue with the series on in Christ and then we pray. We teach, we pray, we teach, we pray. We go home, we teach, we pray. Amen? Amen. All right, grab your offerings, everybody. Every time we hear the word, we give in honor of Christ. Lift up that offering. Father, we bring it in honor. And we thank you for the privilege to give this morning and the opportunity to grow in the knowledge of Christ. We decree that as we give, our offering is worship. Our offering is a sweet smell before you. 
And we rejoice that through our giving, the nations of the earth are invaded with the truth of the gospel. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. Online community, we're going to sign you off. You don't want to miss the next service at 11 a.m. as we continue teaching you the word in this year's edition, season three of the In Christ Realities. We love you guys. Enjoy Christ and enjoy what he has done. Till I see you at 11 a.m. Invite more people to be part of the service. And until then, be blessed. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service this morning. Glory! Glory!